All right, guys, today we are back with another Epic History TV. We are continuing on with Napoleon. This time, Napoleon 1813, the road to Leipzig. That's, uh, we just witnessed Napoleon's retreat, and I believe he was gathering up a new army to fight his new enemies, or, well, returning enemies, the Prussians and the Austrians. Let's go ahead and dive right back into it. What a career Napoleon has ruined. Having gained so much glory, he could bestow peace on Europe. But he has not done so. The spell is broken. Yeah, he really uh, fumbled the ball there. Emperor Alexander of Russia. 1812 had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. That's one way to put it. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now, Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favourable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled, and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Smart Europe man. from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Honestly, on Alexander's part, I think that's the smartest move he could do. I mean, also, I think it's a safe bet. I think Alexander, you know, you could also make the safe bet that eventually the British, because of the successes in Spain currently, and the Prussians and Austrians seeming to turn right now, um, I don't know how much of that he knew if the Austrians or Prussians were going to turn. But I think, you know, if you think about it, it's a safe bet to assume that you're not going to be the only one attacking Napoleon. So you're going to be getting some help, um, so you might as well keep pushing and get even more land, even more of a favorable treaty. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Okay, yeah. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army. But he left for the Kingdom of Naples, hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. No oh, shit, he's already... <laughs> the mad lad Mira is already like, yup, oh, nah, nah, Napoleon, I'm out. You gave me a kingdom and now I'm gonna peace out. <laughs> Jeez. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command and now faced odds of four to one. Oh shit, fucking get out of there, dude. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client Poor state, Poland. the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Three Good weeks Poland. later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden... And that won't be the last time Russians enter Berlin. ...joined the Allies. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johan. How did he... <sighs> How did he end up king of Sweden? I don't understand that family line, how a Frenchman became king of Sweden. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's crown prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. You know, you gotta respect In that. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain. Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since Smart the revolution, man. with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain. Jeez, he agreed Britain's to field just throwing an army money of 80,000 men. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, 
summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor. This is the final decisive struggle, an honorable peace or a heroic end. Known as the German War of Liberation. Oh. The Prussian okay. army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished Damn. flogging, expanded recruitment, and introduced exams for officers. That's a major and overhaul. Overhauled training, tactics, and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small so mean. They'd learned most of it from him. Only a short time ago, I was the conqueror of the world, commanding the largest and finest army of modern times. It's all gone now. Napoleon, Count Molay, Tullier, Palace. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, Jeez. the home defense force, were transferred to Germany. So many fucking... Where are you getting these people? <laughs> France doesn't have that big of a population. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises, after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. Hmm. They were young what a mad and raw. Mad Two thirds were teenagers. And oh. There was a severe lack of experienced officers and NC Okay, yeah, they're running, they're they're scraping the barrel there. TOs, in short, the countless irreplaceable veterans, now lying beneath Russian soil. Or Russian. There was also no. a critical shortage of cavalry. Strut the big and make your hobbies prance. Satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks Traitors. raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Smart move. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. God damn. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to Ooh. pneumonia on the 28th of April. Well, his still role got was off. taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. Oh shit, Napoleon's got they the were advantage. Now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. 
the art of war was only the art of not taking risks, glory would belong to mediocrity. We need a full triumph. Napoleon, with his marshals, dun dun. As Napoleon intense. advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk a battle a against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight. A potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, has commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball. Oof! Instantly. Well, this was quick. was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's Third Corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, Woo! losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, Damn. mortally wounded, That's was a among lot. Them. That's not good for the French. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Ooh, big Neither brain plays. Happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south, to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. Okay. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's Ooh, trap. Damn. Okay. Oh, that's, that's so lucky for them. Once for more, the, Russians the Allies fought with great Prussians. determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. The French can't keep there trading were more casualties, casualties like that. During the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. Ooh. His slow pain- The spider was crawling across my desk. I'm lucky I made it out alive. No, I'm just kidding. I crushed that bitch. Fuck spiders, dude. Ruining my recording? Come on, I'm trying to? No, no, no. Can't sabotage me like that. In full death, deeply upset Napoleon. Rest in peace, Durak. The emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack oh, of experienced no cavalry. Well, 
Past well, Leipzig Udino now. was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. Von Bülow's? Is that the fucking name? It's on the 2nd of name. June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Yeah, he's probably tired of fighting. He doesn't have the manpower to keep going. My eagles are again victorious, but my star is setting. Napoleon to General Bülow. Secor. The armistice Telecom. of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops. Even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter, Marie-Louise, in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich you know what's great about Metternich? Even when I took uh, a course called AP European History back in high school, I don't remember his name at all. And I've taken I've taken courses on European history in college. And Metternich has not been mentioned. <sighs> Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. Mm. In June, he so a little bit early, uh, um, fucking Bismarck uh, politics traveled there. to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He uh -oh. would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie tantrum. in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. Only because you pushed yourself so far, Napoleon. Your fault. Expect a defeat whenever the Emperor attacks in person. Attack and defeat his lieutenants whenever you can. General Moreau to Emperor Alexander. No, yeah, 100%. Do that. That's how On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of three to oh two. Oh my God! And Emia. a new strategy: Trachtenberg plan. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks, and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Honestly, the only plan you Over can the do against few Napoleon. Months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including eight million pounds in silver and gold coins, Sheesh. 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, Damn. 18 million rounds Holy of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, Ooh, 175,000 nice. pairs of boots, 1.5 million that's... pounds of beef, biscuit, oh, that's and flour, a lot of food. and 28,000 gallons oh, yeah, of have rum, the rum and brandy. brandy. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Wow. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, Holy meanwhile, shit. had turned Dresden into that a major much? supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. 
Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Okay. Napoleon He's being then smart. received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, MacDonald? and raced back to Irishman? Dresden, sending Van Damme's 1st Corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Ooh. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. Ooh. Okay, but that's a good trade off for Napoleon. He's, he's, he's getting better again. Head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Oh, that's Macdonald not good. lost 30,000 men. Oh, that's Three not good. eagles and a hundred guns for Blücher's 22,000 casualties. You know, that's not a good trade-off. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon Oof. sent Ney to take over from Udino, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. Mad lad Ney. fighting to save Berlin held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another oh, 22,000 no, men. Ney, how could you fail? Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. Yikes, the Allied Napoleon, plan yikes. was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced, and advanced wherever he was not. Yeah, that'd be, His teenage that'd be frustrating. were exhausted by constant forces. marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. 
There will inevitably be a great battle at Leipzig. Napoleon, Marshal Ney, 13th of October, 1813. Yeah, yeah there By will be. October 1813, Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in <laughs> Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides, and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. What a bamboozle! Bavaria! Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. Looks if like the he's city fell, surrounded. Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would okay, risk he's everything. He's throwing the in dice. One great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Dun dun dun! Thank that you. was Napoleon 1813, The Road to Leipzig by Epic History TV. I hope you guys enjoyed. I have nothing to add here at the end. Um, is like always, you know, I do a good job. I don't, there's nothing really to comment more on here at the end. They covered everything that needed to be covered in, in what they talked about in this episode. Yeah, so that was the road to Leipzig. Uh, next time we will be watching the Battle of the Nation, Battle of Leipzig. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.